post this later. So hello, everyone. I am Nathan Polinski. I'm with the University of Minnesota Extension. I am working with my coworker, Dave Bao. He will be presenting a little bit later on this morning. And uh, hopefully you can learn something. We do have some handouts for this workshop and those are available at a Z link that we will throw in the chat a little bit later on uh, this morning. So we met last week. This is a four part webinar series. On October 4th, we discussed goals, how to set goals, what kind of goals, and then assembling your team, which is who are you working with to make these decisions? What other family members are you keeping in the loop? And what other you know, business professionals like your banker, your accountant, maybe there's a lawyer or a farm business management uh, instructor that you're working with that's gonna help you work through some of these decisions. Today, we are gonna be focusing on taxes and how to gift assets, selling assets, transferring of different assets. So that's kind of our highlight today. And we'll go ahead and get started. So again, all things tax. So selling, gifting, transferring, what all tax comes into play and what are some best ways to alleviate some of the burdens. So again, this is what we're gonna be going over today. We can see we have some sales, proper sale ideas and strategies. What about gifting? Everyone's probably heard that term of gifting. We'll go over a little more detail about the pros and cons. And then inheritance. And then you can see that big word in the back here, basis. What does basis mean? And how does that play into effect with selling these assets? And what are the tax implications with the basis that is out there. We do wanna highlight here that farms are not all the same, right? Not everyone's in the same boat. These materials may apply to different farms differently. So keep that in mind. There's no one size fits all approach to the farm transition process, but hopefully these ideas help, help you out and help stir some good progress in your farm transition process. Okay, so again, your estate and transition goals, right? That's what we discussed last week. Those goals are the foundation for your estate plan, right? The goals are gonna help dictate where you want to go, what you, in a best case scenario, would like to see happen. Understanding the financial ramifications and implications with your different goals um, is, is gonna be key, right? So setting up your goals, and then looking at the financial ramifications, what are the tax implications of selling this to my son or my daughter or gifting this to my grandchildren or my niece or neighbor, right? Those is what hopefully today is gonna to help, um, help you guys out with. And then you can go meet with your professionals to make your goals a reality once you understand some of these implications. So again, the succession involves the transferring of the operations of the business, not just the assets. All too often, when talking about the farm transition process, we jump right into how do we sell the assets and, and keep it from the nursing home or from paying taxes, which are good strategies, but we also need to talk about the succession of the business where we talk about the transition of the labor, the income from the business, and the management. You've probably been operating your farm as the, the boss, the CEO, the manager of that farm business for 20, 30, 40 years. That needs to transfer over the course of time. You can't just transfer the assets and hope that your successor understands the proper way to run the business. So the succession of the business is important. And then the transfer, which is again, gonna be a little bit more on the asset side of things. Um, but again, additional process beyond just the state plan. So both of these are important, right? Both the transition 
and the estate planning involve questions of fair versus equal and family dynamics. So we're talking about selling assets today and who do you give your assets to? Let's say you have four children. Only one of them is helping taking over the farm. The other three have careers off the farm. How are you going to split your asset ownership? You probably have some farm, some non-farm assets that you own. What's that fair versus equal amongst your four separate children, right? Family dynamics are an important thing to think about and to, to make sure you make your goals of the asset transition known to your family member at an appropriate time. Okay, so again, farm transfer, this is going to be that business management, that labor, annual farm income, farm asset ownership. Okay, the farm transfer is important. We also want to talk about the farm and personal estate. So what about some of those personally owned assets? Let's talk about retirement accounts. Maybe you have $100,000 saved up in the bank as your retirement income. What are you going to do with that? Is there going to be some left at the end of your life expectancy? So again, all these come into play. And I know talking about death is tough, especially talking about your own mortality is a tough conversation to have. Most people don't know when that is going to happen, but that's why planning ahead is so important. We need to stay on top of it to at least have some goals and a strategy laid out. So again, when it comes to asset ownership, you have three major transfer choices with getting assets out of your name. So selling them, again, that's a fairly easy thing to comprehend. You wanna sell farmland to your son. Maybe your son's taking over the farming operation, you wanna sell him 100 acres. All right, figure out a price, a contract, it's sold, right? Not soup, there's more to it, but we can understand the idea. Gifting, again, there are gifting and we'll highlight the numbers behind that and some of the pros or cons as well, but gifting is a good strategy. The biggest negative with gifting is, does the older generation who's gifting these assets to the younger generation, can they afford to give away assets without getting money for them? Because the idea of a gift is you're not getting money in exchange because that would then be selling it. So again, that's the pros and cons of gifting. An inheritance mechanism, right? What about a will, right? As you write your will, that's going to have... Um, the transfer of ownership. There's a several other uh, strategies that Dave will talk about a little bit later on this morning as well. And trusts, um, estates can have different inheritance mechanisms built in, but that's a separate way. Okay, so again, each of these choices have possible basis and tax consequences. And we'll talk all about these on uh, the next hour or so with you guys. So again, back to this um, slide here, right? Sales, that's going to be while alive. You're going to sell this asset while you're alive to your son, daughter, grandchildren, neighbor. There's going to be a price with that. Gift, again, you can gift away assets <clears throat> while you are alive. <clears throat> but that, uh, again, you are not going to receive income from the sale of that, from the gifting away your assets. And then uh, the inheritance, that's going to be after we pass on. So you can say, after I die, I want son number one to take this parcel of land, my daughter to take these other assets. The inheritance is after we pass on. So I want everyone to think about this, right? In your farm transition and estate plan, do you plan to use sales, gifts, the inheritance mechanisms, right? Maybe that's going to be through a will. Do you plan on using one of the three or all of the three, two of the three? What do you think is going to happen? And again, throughout the next hour, we'll highlight the pros and cons of each of these. But 
there is a place for each of them, but then also not everyone is going to use all of them. But I want everyone to kind of think about that as we work through this. So we're going to talk about basis, asset basis. So basis is the cost to recover when you sell an asset. Okay, your basis in an asset uh, may change each year. And that's going to be your adjusted basis as you have depreciation. And we have some examples to highlight this point. But if you buy a tractor and you depreciate that tractor over the course of seven years, it's going to reduce the basis in that tractor and it's going to become your new adjusted basis. Basis is generally determined by how you acquired the asset or how long you held the asset. So in farmland, your basis is typically going to be your purchase price. So if you bought farmland you know, 10 years ago for $5,000 an acre, that is your basis. If you bought farmland 50 years ago for $500 an acre, that is your basis. Again, that's gonna be your original purchase price plus or minus depreciation and or improvements. So again, here's an example here. So if you purchase the asset, it's gonna be what you paid for it, plus improvements, minus any depreciation. So again, if you bought a tractor five years ago for $175,000, over the last five years, you have accumulated $98,000 worth of depreciation. Your adjusted basis today is $77,000, right? It's the difference of your purchase price minus depreciation. In this example, there were no improvements done to this tractor. Okay, so your adjusted basis, 77,000. Capital assets. Some assets are capital assets. So generally, that's going to be um, owned for personal investment purchases. So think of your stocks and bonds, your retirement savings that way. Your house can also be a capital asset. Typically in the farm, the farmland, the machinery, the buildings, breeding livestock, by IRS definition, are not capital assets. However, depending on their classification and your classification, based on you know, separate material participating rules, they may receive capital gains treatment. So potentially with, if you sell livestock, that may receive capital gains treatment. And then sometimes they will be um, subject to depreciation recapture. So for example, if you have that same tractor from the previous slide that you purchased for $175,000, you depreciated $98,000, your adjusted basis at $77,000. If you sell that for $100,000, you have $23,000 of depreciation recapture. And we have a, a visual to help, help show that point of that depreciation recapture and how that plays into selling some of these assets as well. So again, if you sell assets, if you sell assets while you are alive, there is no stepped up in basis. <clears throat> so what does this step up in basis mean? So again, if you <clears throat> if you uh, gift and if you uh, inherit inherit a tractor through a will from, let's say your parents. Let's say this tractor is worth again at uh, the Adjusted basis is $77,000. The fair market value today is $100,000. If that tractor that you inherit through a, you know, a will, that may receive a step up in basis. So then instead of having a $77,000 worth of adjusted basis, it may jump step up to $100,000. With farmland, um, that could become an ever more important topic. Whereas if you bought farmland 50 years ago for $400 an acre, and today it's worth $8,000 per acre, <clears throat> if you transfer that farmland through an inheritance mechanism like a will, that land will receive a step up in basis at the fair market value at the date of death. <clears throat> 
So let's say that it goes from $400 an acre all the way to $8,000 an acre. That's a huge step up in basis that then the new farmland owner, let's say it's the daughter, she doesn't have to pay capital gains tax on that difference, right? Previously, there was $7,600 per acre in, in gains. And with the step up in basis, some of those gains are alleviated because now the, the new asset has a higher basis. Okay, and we have a few more examples to highlight that point, but step up in basis is an important thing to think about. Again, selling assets here, that can create some income or capital gains tap, tax implications um, for the old owner, especially with a low basis. Contract for deed can have some tax implications if done later in life. Um, the heirs continue to pay taxes on that principal or interest payments. So again, everything has implications, and hopefully today we can highlight a few of them. So again, large one-time sales can cause tax issues for the seller because they have a huge influx of income for one year if they sold their machinery and land all in one year and all of a sudden they have to pay, you know, they're in a high income bracket, they're going to be higher than their usual tax bracket for that year. And potentially they're going to have some other depreciation recapture taxes all due in one year. So large one-time sales can be expensive for the seller and taxes, and also can be difficult for the entering generation if they have to go to the bank and borrow, you know, a million dollars to buy all the farmland and all the equipment and livestock at once. Okay, installment sales, they can spread income over the duration of the sale, can lower the tax burden, but again, there is some still some tax consequences that we need, need to be cognizant about. And we can see there may be some exemptions for machinery or breeding livestock. It's depends on the specific situation. The piecemeal sales can work well. What we mean by that is selling one piece at a time. <clears throat> kind of like Johnny Cash in his song, one piece at a time here, you sell a tractor here, then the next year you sell a couple cows, maybe five years down the road, you sell the rest of the cows, then you sell one parcel of land, it's, it, it can work well, but it's a slower process. And if time is not on your side, it may not be the best option. But we like to highlight all the different options that we have. Again, crop and market livestock sales um, are subject to self-employment tax. So again, a lot of tax may have to be paid. There are ways to kind of pay a little bit less. And that's why we encourage you to make goals and then work with your accountant before you do anything to look more specifically at your individual tax implications and the pros or cons of, of waiting a year or two or selling one group of assets for another. So again, selling $20,000 worth of cows, having an unclaimed appreciation amount of $5,000 would result in $15,000 of taxable income. Okay, and again, we have a, a separate graphic to highlight that, but taxes are going to be pretty tough to avoid, I think is one of our bottom dollar or bottom points here. So how is this income going to be taxed and at what rates? And unfortunately, we don't have a great answer because it depends. It depends on your individual tax bracket, right? Are you in the 20% tax bracket? Or maybe with all these sales, you're going to jump up into the 37% tax, tax bracket. It depends on where you lie with your income. And then different assets may have capital gains treatment. They may also be ordinary income. It depends. And this is this graphic I've been referring to where let's just say that you have a small tractor. Okay. You originally bought this tractor for $10,000 10 years ago. You have depreciated $5,000 of that tractor. So it's adjusted basis is $5,000. That's what your adjusted basis is. That initial 
$5,000 of the sale price. So we're selling this tractor for 20,000 bucks. That first $5,000 is depreciation recapture because you depreciated that as an expense on your taxes, but you have to recapture that because you got your depreciation back. So that first $5,000 is going to be ordinary income typically, and then there's no SE tax. And then that additional $10,000 of sale price over your original purchase price is typically going to be capital gains. And then it's going to be your applicable cap capital gains rate, which again, that is going to change a little bit depending on your bracket. It's usually uh, around 15 to 20% on the federal level. Um, so just, again, keep that in mind. But then that we want to highlight too on this purchase price, that adjusted basis and below, that's not tax. That's kind of what your cost of goods sold, I think is maybe a silly way to explain that. And that's not um, taxed on that rate. So hopefully this picture helps clarify. I know we're throwing out a lot of terms. Maybe you've heard them before, but they also get a little bit uh, repetitive too of recapture of depreciation and capital gains, but they all do come into effect here with how much you need to pay um, for taxes on some of these assets. <clears throat> so on current assets, there's no basis, okay? So we do get to deduct some eligible expenses. Um, again, it just kind of depends on the specific item. We do must consider our ordinary income tax rate. So again, what tax bracket are you going to be in? Self-employment tax. Some things are going to be taxed for self-employment. Some things not. Um, there's potentially the, the Medicare surtax. There's also potentially the net investment income tax. You know, there's a lot of taxes that are potentially going to be paid. And again, we want you to work with your accountant um, to help you know, minimize some of the taxes that you, that you have to pay. That's typically most people's goals is to not pay the most amount of taxes possible. But again, we highlight there's a lot of tax potentially needing to be paid. Working with your accountant is going to help, help alleviate some of that. Um, so the Medicare surtax, is the question in the box here. So that applies to people who are at predetermined income levels and for married filing joint, that's over $250,000. Um, for $200,000 or for single tax filers, that's over $200,000. So it's for typically a little higher income individuals. There's a separate tax um, for Medicare on certain income. So again, you need to break that income threshold. But again, if you the why we highlight this for farm transition, if you're selling farmland or if you're selling equipment, it's not impossible or not even unlikely to get over some of these threshold of two hundred thousand dollars, two hundred fifty thousand dollars here on married filing jointly. So again, it's just a higher income Medicare surtax that's on, on X amount of income that I just listed. Okay, so again, beware of depreciation recapture and capital gains. And then self-employment tax might come into play here as well. And then how do these sales um, there's a question about uh, the chat being disabled. Hopefully, if your Q&A box works, feel free to use your Q&A box. I don't exactly know what to tell you, um, but keep, Q keep using the Q&A if that works. But again, as a recap here, beware of your depreciation, recapture, and capital gains. Look at that self-employment tax, and then consider these when looking at different assets that you want to sell or get out of your out of your name. 
You know, how do these best fit within your broader su succession goals? Because the next thing we'll talk about is gifting, right? Gifting, it can be used. So it can be used, right? It can help start an entering generation into the farm business, right? You can say, hey, we're going to gift you, you know, maybe it's going to be that small tractor instead of, you know, they purchased it for $10,000. Instead of selling it, maybe we'll gift it to the son, help them get started in the farm business. Um, you can transfer some income tax obligations to children because they'll probably be in a lower tax bracket. So there's some tax advantages with gifting assets. It can also help reduce the taxable estate by gifting things out of your estate. They're no longer part of your estate. Um, charitable purposes, there's a lot of uh, gifting to charities. Maybe you are a member of your local church and you want to say, I want to give the church part of my estate and I want to gift them some things. There's tax advantages with that. There's a lot more as well. So gifting is um, an option. Um, the numbers on that Medicare surtax, I can, uh, let me go back a little bit. I'm typing them in, Nathan. I'm typing them in on the- All on right, the thank you, Dave. So they will respond to you on that. But again, gifting is a, a strategy. So in many cases, gifts will not result in any taxable event for either party, either the person giving the gift or receiving the gift. A lot of times there's no tax implications with that. Every person can gift up to $17,000 per person to as many people per year with no tax implications. So in 2022, that number was $16,000. It is indexed for inflation. So it will... Um, be increasing, you know, typically year over year with the inflation um, that we just have in our world. So again, it's not uncommon to say, I want to give, but I'm just going to say an example, we have mom and dad, and they have daughter and son-in-law coming back to help on the farm. We can have mom give daughter and son-in-law individually $17,000. So now we're at $34,000 worth of assets that the mom can gift away. Same thing for the dad. If he wants to give both his daughter and son-in-law $17,000 worth of assets, that's $34,000. The parents can gift their daughter and son-in-law a total of $68,000 a year. So this is not a small number when you can expand upon each individual person can give away that $17,000. So it uh, can add up, is I guess the one point one we want to point out. So on top of the annual exclusion, there's a lifetime combined gift slash estate slash generation skipping transfer. On the federal level, it's $12.92 million per person. So again, this number is indexed for inflation. Um, in 2022, it was 12.06 million. So it jumped almost a full million dollars, which is a big number. We do want to highlight though, that on the federal level there with that 12 point million, 12.92 million, that is set to sunset at the end of 2025. So January 1 of 2026, as written, that's gonna go back down to um, I think as of now, 5 million plus inflation. So it'll be probably closer to $7 million. And they this is per person on the federal level. But again, this is one of those things in Washington, D.C. that's getting a little bit of pushback. This was a change as of the Tax, Chut, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that um, President Trump signed in in. Uh, 2017 or 2018. So these are not um, going into perpetuity. They do have a sunset there. And come 2026, we don't exactly know what that number is going to be. But as of now, it's a really big number. So you don't have to pay federal estate tax on anything under $12.92 million per person. So with a, a married couple, you can more or less double that number to you know, a little over $25 million. 
Minnesota does not have a gift tax, um, but it does add back three years. So if you, um, let's just say that you end up in a nursing home and you um, have bills to pay at the nursing home, the state can look back over the last three years and say, hey, those gifts that you gave away two years ago, they want the state can ask for money back from the um, donee or the person receiving that gift. They can say, hey, we need X amount of dollars that that gift was worth. Um, so hopefully I highlighted that three year look back um, again, if the state is looking for, let's just say you go into a nursing home and that you don't have the income set aside to, to pay that, the state can say, we need money for your nursing home stay because you didn't pay out of your own personal pocket. The state can say, hey, the last three years worth of gifts, we want some money back for that. So hopefully that that helps clarify that three-year look back on the gifts. Okay, and so again, gifts are valued at fair market value. The donor's basis goes with that gift. So we talked about the step up in basis. The step up in basis does not apply to gifts. They simply, the, the basis that that item has, that asset has in the gift, it just transfers with it. It, it does not change at all. So if the donee then sells the gift in the future, there may be a greater tax burden on that because of that low basis. And I'll, I have an example that I'll highlight that a little bit more as well. So when utilizing partnerships or a corporation, you can actually gift more value because of the discounting of assets, okay? So what does this discounting of assets mean? I'm just gonna check, um, yeah, the discounting of assets, discounting gifts. So in a closely held uh, family business, like a lot of farms are, there's not um, a very clear price point of what that farm business is worth, right? So, you know, your, your farm is not traded on the New York Stock Exchange. Like if you wanted to buy stock in Apple, you could go to the New York Stock Exchange right now and say, hey, one share is worth $150, right? That's very easy to find. That information is public. The value of some of these smaller companies are a lot tougher to decipher. And especially on a small, closely held family corporation, if you are a minority stockholder, does your say matter? Let's just say that there's four brothers farming and you want to buy one of the brothers' shares. You would have a 25% stake in the business. The other three brothers would have 75%. Does your vote really matter, right? You never, in that scenario, you wouldn't have a majority share. Right, And that's kind of highlighting with their picture of a group in this small family. And the IRS understands that, that owning some of those small businesses, those tightly held family corporations or businesses, there's not a lot of incentive to have a minority stake. And with that, they have allowed some discounting of assets. So you can say, hey, you can typically do around 20 to 30% reduction in the value of those assets. You get much over 30%, it can be questionable. There have been some tax audits where they have discounted some of these assets by you know 50% or more, and that's a red flag. The IRS is gonna say, hey, you're clearly disguising some of the transfer of this ownership. So again, we highlighted in the previous slide that with gifting, uh, discounted gifting, you can really transfer more assets. So let's just say that you want to transfer this tractor that's worth $100,000 over the course of a couple of years to your son. You can say, hey, in this closely held business, this business asset is really, you could value it closer to you know $80,000, right? You can get that 20% discount 
on that gift and transfer it um, into this farming business. Maybe you want to say you have an LLC and you have shares in this corp in this LLC of your farm business. And you want to say, hey, we want the farm is valued at one million dollars. We're gonna, you know, gift away one percent annually to our son and daughter-in-law. Again, if that you know million dollars, you can incorporate some of the discounting of the value of that. Again, I would recommend working with your accountants to kind of highlight um, the specifics behind that, but discounting of gifts is allowable. The 60 basis story. So again, I've talked about farmland step up and basis is an important thing to consider. I know my coworker shared this story with me about someone came in and said they had farmland with $60 per acre basis. And in today's fair market value, it's going to be valued at around $10,000. So there's a huge, you know, $9,940 worth of capital gains on that farmland if it's going to be sold today. So there's two sides to this story. This can either be, you know, farmland that the family wants to gift to their son or daughter, right? If they gift that to their son or daughter, the son or daughter has very strong incentive to not sell that farmland into the future. So if you want to make sure that this farmland stays in the family, you can gift that away because if they go to sell that, you know, in the next couple of years, once they gain ownership, they have huge tax implications to sell that. Whereas the other side of the story with this really low basis farmland, if you transfer that via a will or another inheritance mechanism, then this farmland would receive the step up in basis. And instead of that $60 basis, it would jump up to the fair market value on the day of death, let's just say $10,000. And in that case, then the family has a little less incentive to hold on to the farmland financially because if they sold it now upon their gain of ownership, their tax implications are very minimal. They wouldn't have that $9,900 worth of capital gains. They would have more or less zero upon that step up in basis. So that's kind of the big pros and cons here of step up in basis and gifting assets, where in the gifting, you do not gift away or the, the basis does not change. We do want to highlight here, documenting gifts in writing is a good idea, right? There is um, some forms that the IRS has, and well, that's on the next slide, but we can list the date of the gift, the donor, the donee, so who's giving it, who's receiving this gift, what is the fair market value of that gift, what's the basis of that gift? Again, what is the original purchase price of the farmland? What about the tax-adjusted basis in machinery? Right For machinery, what's the other, the May, the model, the serial number, and description? Say, hey, this is a 1995 tractor, you know, John Deere, whatever the series is, right? And list the serial number description and store these documents in a safe place. We have it highlighted there at the top. Getting this notarized is never a bad idea, right? Just kind of proof that this did occur. Typically, you can find notaries at, you know, a lot of banks have notaries inside or maybe the post office, uh, even some of the extension offices have notaries, um, the courthouse. Um, it shouldn't be too difficult to find a notary. Okay, again, amounts that exceed the annual gift exclusion of $17,000 um, given to someone other than the spouse or qualifying charity require paperwork. So again, that $17,000 is something you need to keep in mind Right, we have that file the 709. That's the gift tax return. No tax is going to be due until you exceed that 12.92 million dollar lifetime gift exclusion. 
So you have that 12.92 million to burn up before you pay gift tax. But when you start filing that 709 paperwork, that'll put into place what the fair market value of that gift is. And the IRS, after I believe it's five years, cannot come back and say, hey, that was a dis, you know, that value of that asset was higher than you listed. So once you file that paperwork, the IRS, it starts a clock about when they cannot argue with the value that you put down on that paperwork. So any tax due is imposed on the person transferring assets rather than on the recipient. IRS can collect a decedent's unpaid tax from those receiving the assets. So again, don't we keep that in mind. Uh, one final thing here on this section is the five-year look back in medical assistance. So again, we do want to highlight um, the previous slide said three years, actually, and that I want to highlight, Dave, is that for something else or should it be five years? Um, the five-year look back is is really for the medical assistance. So if you're on a nursing home issue, the three-year look back is for estate taxes. So oh. if you in Minnesota, state taxes have a three-year look back. This is, but a five-year gift look back is for nursing home costs. If you have a medical assistance in nursing home, They'll go back five years if you had wealth or gave something away in those five years. It it affects that. So that's the difference between the two types. All right. Thank you, Dave. I might have misspoke earlier. That three-year look back, like Dave just clarified, is Minnesota does not have a gift tax, but there is an estate tax. So if you gift away your entire estate and die within a year, Minnesota is going to come say and say, hey, that's a disguised sale. Like, we're going to want some of those estate tax. There's a three-year look back on the estate tax. And now for this one here, the medical assistance. So again, the nursing home is always kind of a scary thought process as people age. Minnesota does have a five-year look back. If you go into a nursing home and you owned assets and gifted those away prior to you moving in or prior to death, there is that five-year look back. So if my parents go to a nursing home, they gift me some assets, and then the nursing home had a bill, they can come after me, like, that's to say I got some farmland for my family, for they would come back to me to pay the nursing home, uh, the bills for when the family member was in there. So five year look back on medical assistance, three year look back on a state tax owed on Minnesota South. He's got a question in the chat box too, just to, uh, oh, charity oh, is like oh, your spouse, is unlimited. So you're, it's, like, it's still a gift, but there's not the limits like there are for other people or just directly to non, you know, non-profit, you can give a, it's a donation, it's also a gift to the charity. So uh, that's how it works as a credit to that. Yeah, thank you, Dave. Hopefully that clarified that as well. Um, and just wrapping up this section, and then Dave will take over. So again, gifting assets, right? Typically does not result in tax to either side, right? Again, that $12.92 million is a really big number. You have to own a lot of assets to have that big of an, uh, um, to get over that threshold. There could have some financial consequences for the older generation if they underestimate their monetary needs. Again, if you gift away your assets, you are by definition not getting money back in exchange. So you need to be careful that you can't, you're not giving away more assets than you can afford, right? You do need to have some retirement savings and something to live on after you give away these assets. You got to balance the retirement needs and uh, and your own personal needs with these gifts. And then again, with your broader farm transition goals, how do gifts fit in, right? Are they, you know, you wanna help the entering generation get into the farm and gifting, you can afford the gift and it's helpful for the younger generation that they can receive these assets at a, a pretty good deal instead of buying them at fair market value. So see how they fit in your personal situation, and then talk with your professionals on tax implications, and then 
make sure you consider your own personal needs as well. Um, there is someone with a, I'm gonna switch, I'm gonna stop sharing Dave. Dave's gonna take over the rest of this section. Someone does have their hand raised. If you can throw a question into the Q&A box or the chat box, I can't answer a question if I don't know what it is. And Dave, can you switch uh, screens because we are seeing the pre presentation here? Oh, you're seeing the other one? Oh, yeah. okay. So how do I do that? You might have to stop sharing it. And then when you hit share screen, select the other screen. All right. Well, am I still displaying it? No, you need to share your screen again. All right. But it'll ask you what screen to share. Uh, so it just says share my screen. All right. Is it sharing it now? No. We got your email now. So no, I think you need to put the PowerPoint on the screen with your email here because we're seeing your. Yeah, no problem. So, you see my, you see it on my, you see my. You can see, yep, we can see the PowerPoint now. All right, so I'll just say from current slide. But now we're still in your. We see your presenter view. There, there we go. I'll there we go. We're good to go, Dave. Sorry about that. All right. <clears throat> So Nathan's walked you through quite a few ideas about all these uh, gifting and and the big what if is really is your retirement income gonna can you gift anything away without having jeopardizing your retirement income? You want to think about your goals, how it's all works into your goals. We're giving a lot of tools, examples, and thinking about this process. So start with your goals that we had last session, and then think about what tools you want to use um, in the process. So here we've got inherit and transfer mechanisms. Wills. Basically, a will is a letter to the judge of what you want to see happen to your assets. So it's a public document. It's very out there for you to display. And we often encourage you can get wills online, you know, and all kinds of things, try to save money. But we recommend you see professionals and have them work you through and get a proper wills just done and go from that. Uh, and you can talk about everything in, in there. Uh, you can... In the will, you can describe who gets the yellow pie plate. We talk about another program, extension personal products. You can talk about uh, all the farm assets. You can be a lot of detail in your will about who gets every asset. But we're going to talk about trusts, and there's lots of trusts out there, lots of different different uh, descriptions. We'll talk about irrevocable and revocable trusts uh, a little bit later. So we'll talk about that. And beneficiary ownership designation. Last time I had a question about that as well. So again, um, you can do a transfer on death, payable on death, those kind of things on stock and market accounts, on bank accounts, on, on land, on house. So we'll talk about that as well. Transfer via inheritance will almost always result in a stepped up basis. Uh, Nathan talked about that. So we have these two things to think about. Are, how long are we going to live? Are we going to go in a nursing home? Half of us are going to go in a nursing home. And for how long? 37 months. The average nursing home stay. So that's going to chip a lot of our money. So if you want to do it, keep it in your, in your name till death, and you can pay that nursing home cost, then the, your heirs get a stepped up basis. Again, so if you have siblings or children, multiple children, one wants to buy the other ones out, the ones that get their income off that sale would get a lot of money with no tax costs. So that's a way to make it fair to all the people. But again, it's going to farm your afford to do that is another question mark. Um, so again, there's lots of ways of doing it. We're going to talk about those ways. Um, you can step up uh, under current law. The fair market value is a way to transfer under current the step up basis. If you keep it till your death, you get based up basis. If you do it before you die, then you establish the basis goals of the gift. Um, fair market value under current laws, which you have to transfer inheritance. So that's the step up basis. Irrevocable, irrevocable trusts function akin to more of a gift and therefore not step up basis. So you set up an irrevocable trust, you're stepping that asset and you're putting outside your control you're not the beneficiary you're not the, you might get the income off it but you don't have any control or say how that it goes in that irrevocable trust 
And when you die, um, it, it goes on however you set it up. So if you, you could give it to a school, you could give it to a church, you could give it to a lot of different things, and they're going to have control of it after you die. And I'm not going to get it back. I might go to my kids after I die too, but it, the set up base is not going to be there because I took those assets and threw them outside of my control. So I don't have any control in the Oracle Trust so they don't get set up bases. All right. Oops. Going fast here. So special use valuation. This is another tool you can use. So special use valuation is that only for, you should be used if you have an estate that has a taxable estate tax. So in Minnesota, our level is $5 million. It's actually everybody has a $3 million exclusion or state taxes. And if you have ag homesteaded property, you can get, or your individual farm or individual business small operator, you can have $2 million extra. So a total of 5 million total, but everybody has for sure 3 million, no matter what your status is. And so if I have a five, $3 million less estate, I won't use this tool. But if I have an estate that's over that 3 million or over the 5 million, I'm gonna pay some estate taxes. I can use this tool, especially if it's, it's gotta be homestead land. 50% of my assets have to be ag and 25% of farmland. And I can save some estate taxes by lowering the value of that land in the value of my estate. So you use the real estate tax on property, five-year average of rent values, use the agribank or farm credits system banks, five-year average interest rate. And that calculation works out to where you start, I will say it's worth 6,000 five-year rents or 230 average property tax is $30. I know this is an old example, but Instead of having six thousand dollars in your estate taxes, by using the formula, it works out to four point four thousand one hundred seven dollars. So you've lowered your estate from six thousand dollars an acre to four thousand one hundred seven dollars an acre, saving the difference. But again, that's a good tool you can use if you have to pay estate taxes. If you don't have to pay estate taxes, don't use it because your heirs' basis becomes the four thousand one hundred seven dollars from special use valuation instead of the fair market value date of death, which would be six thousand. So again. It's a tool you can use um, if you want to. Federal state taxes assessed only amounts exceeding the federal exclusion amount, like Nathan talked about, 12.92 million right now. And it might change at the end of 25, but right now it's 12.92 million. Um, the credit is applicable to the exclusion amount, so that credit equals basically what your tax would be from dollar one up to 12.92 million. And that's the current 23 exclusion. So that'll probably change next year when we get another inflation adjustment and inflation is still pretty high. Um, you can also use a gift tax exclusion. So like Nathan said earlier, you've got 12.92 million. You can give everything away today. If, uh, if you have a state less than that, no federal state taxes. It's a gift to the next generation. You give that $12, $12 million state away, your basis goes to the gift. So they get whatever your basis is at $12 million in assets. That's their basis. It might be 4 million. So you're transferring the assets to the next generation or whoever you want to give it to, but the basis goes to the gift. So you can do that while you're alive, or you can give away $6 million today, use it as a gift tax exclusion. And then when I die, I'm going to have $6,922 million, $920 million. You get half that. So there's a, lots of tools out there to use so you can do it while you're alive or when you pass. Um, exclusions of credits are per person. They vary by year, law and exclusion. So like Minnesota, They've been talking about getting Minnesota everybody up to $5 million because that was at the time would have matched the federal government. And we, we have that bill proposed oftentimes. There's also bills that drives federal, um, but that always doesn't happen. Federal estate tax is portable. So if I usually the, the guys die first, and if husband and wife were we fortunate to have a $16 million estate together, well, we each own $8 million in assets. So today, if I die, um, I would I would not pay a tax on mine. And I only used up eight million in my 12.92. The thing I have to think about if I gave my wife the eight million today, if I have a I love you will, she'd get her eight million plus my eight million. That's what she have. 16 million, and she'd be above the, the portable part because she'd have her 12.92 million and she would get my four million. So actually, if portable because it's portable, she would be she'd be covered. Follow that set because it's I didn't use all my exclusion. Together, we have a $24 million exclusion amount. So when I died at $8 million, she would be covered. And when she dies, she gets, she's over the $12 million, $12.92 million. But because she, I didn't use up all mine, it's portable to her. So her whole estate's going to be a subject to no tax, federal estate tax, because under the, the new her threshold would be 
uh, 12.92 million plus the 4.92 million I did not use. So you add that together, it's above 16, 17 something. Okay, so she's not going to pay taxes because it's portable to the spouse. So, polling pause. Minnesota has lower state tax exclusion than the amount of federal of tax free exclusion from a to an area than the federal government. True or false? You know what this means? What's the estate tax exclusion? I'll give you a few seconds to think about it, but we just talked about a little bit, and Nathan talked about a little bit. There are two different things for the state and federal government. So you should have an answer that this is um, true, basically. Federal government's 12.92 million per individual. The Minnesota state tax exclusion is either the 5 million, if you have a farm property up to the $2 million, or everybody in the Minnesota has a $3 million regardless of their occupation. So we all have 3 million for sure. If you're a farmer or a small business person, you can have another uh, two more million. Q and A up there. I gotta slow down. Yes, I talk too fast sometimes. I'll slow down. I will try. All right, done. I get so excited about all the things I have so much to talk about. I just keep going. So I will slow down. Nathan does a much better job of slowing it down than I do. So the Minnesota estate tax. Um, it is a $5 million exclusion if you're a small farm or small business. It's $3 million for every individual in the state of Minnesota, husband and wife. So if you have a $6 million less estate, the ideal situation would be is you each own $3 million and you don't have I love you will, which means it goes to the surviving spouse. That $3 million first spouse to die goes somewhere else. So the second we both did our, $5 million, our $3 million exclusion up in our lifetime when we die, I didn't give it to my surviving spouse because it's not portable in Minnesota. So therefore, we do not want to do that. Okay, because she would have, if I die first, a $6 million estate, and it'd be above the $3 million if she wasn't a farmer. If she was a farmer and she had homestead of ground, it'd be $5 million, still above this Minnesota level. And that's what the slide that basically shows. So again, it all depends on how you got your will set up. Your state tax plans are, are relevant on how you do it. Uh, and so again, um, if you have payable on death, transfer on death, those kind of things will actually help your estate as a process too. Oops. Here. Okay, Minnesota does have estate tax rates. So it's prorated by the size of your estate, taxable estate. So let's just say we're a non-farmer and it starts at $3 million, $1 over $3 million is taxed at 13%. And it goes up to a sliding scale to very end at 16% when you get to a bigger number of an estate. Again, Minnesota has that $3 million exclusion for everybody, so each of us, no matter what we do. And some of us are non-homesteaded farmers. We were, we're multiple generations later and we have farmland, but we're not the active farmers. We don't have homesteaded ground anymore. Therefore, we're not gonna be qualified for this qualified farm property exclusion. Um, and if we do that, it could give you additional $2 million. So we'll talk more about that too. So what is, the Minnesota Qualified Farm Property Exclusion. Well, first of all, it must be ag homestead ground when the person dies. So that's the first requirement, the date of death. It must be classified as ag land, that's two A's ag land, and that ag homestead. And to keep that ag homestead, an ag relative must be on the homestead, or it's a special ag homestead. So there's treatments out there. Basically, if your property tax statements say it's, it'll tell you on each parcel of the ground what you have, if it's homestead or not, okay? So when, there's, when you retire, you have to live within like six, I think 16 townships. There's a, there's a document out there on our website too that'll tell you how to figure out if you're, if you're qualified as homestead ground and that will keep you that $2 million additional. But again, if you look at your tax statement, um, you had to continue to own it as a business before you retired. And then three years by the end of the death, before your death, you're renting it out. As long as you did though, either one of those are a combination you'll be fine, it'll still be homesteaded ground. And then that'll add two million, up $2 million more to your $3 million we all have. So it, you can get up to $2 million, you might not have that much. Um, the students had continually, the student continuously owned the qualified property for three years before death. So they had to own that. Or the qualified heirs farming members must maintain the ag property three years after death. So we've had these workshops where a gentleman from in Minnesota and their kids were in Florida and New York. They had no intention to move back to Minnesota. They had no intention of maintaining the farm. So they could do this tool and get the qualified exemption because dad and mom had it in ag property as homestead of ground. But if they, uh, three years later, they uh, sell it, 
decide they want to sell it, they'll lose this exclusion and have to pay it back. So they don't have to actually farm it. They don't have to maintain the homestead after after it's passed down that generation. But if they sell it, at, they'd have met the terms in three years after death. So again, if you do that, if you use the exclusion up front, up to $2 million for a homestead and, and this qualified business exclusion, property exclusion, and you decide to sell it when three years after you obtained it, the heirs obtained it, you have to pay it your capture tax. Basically, you pay back all of the exclusion amount you got, or 16% of that uh, qualified. You have to pay it back to the government. So you also have to maintain the ag qualifications for the land on the qualified property. So you can't turn it into housing right away. Take it out of ag property and put it into development. You've got to maintain the ag code for the property. And you also have to file appropriate yearly returns saying you're maintaining that ag property, okay? So how much can be transferred by state tax-free under current law? Federally, it's up to 12.92 million per person at the federal level. So each one of us can have that level federally and we can transfer those assets tax-free for state taxes. In Minnesota, it's up to 5 million, depending on if you have a qualified farm or not to get the extra 2 million. But all of us have a $3 million for sure. Um, again, it depends on your definition, uh, how much, what you're gonna do a lot. And also laws do change. And we talked about this earlier, the federal state tax is gonna sunset in, in the 25. And right now he said it's gonna compact around 7 million. So, <clears throat> Minnesota has no gift tax, but they had a three-year look back. So if you gave a gift, somebody in the last three years before your death, it does get pulled back into your Minnesota state tax calculation. But that's all that use it's used for there. Um, the nursing home has that five-year look back for nursing home costs. Um, but federally, it's 40% on, on a state tax and 40% for the gift taxes. So it's a big number once you go over that 12.92 million with either or combination. On uh, Minnesota, again, I told you earlier, it was 13 to 60 percent prorated as the size of the state grows, and the laws could change any time, but this is how laws are today, as we're talking. Okay. So what's included when you're calculating your gross estate? What, what's included that 5 million, that 3 million, and 12.92 million? Both probate property and non-probate property is included in the gross estate value. The seed chair, chair of joint tenancy property. So again, if we'll talk about titling and next session, but when you have joint tenancy property, your share, whatever you own of that, if it's three-way split, two-way split, your siblings or whatever, your share of that property will be included. Anything you own solely or tenancy in common or share in community property assets, other states around here like uh, Arizona for retirement and uh, Wisconsin are community property, so those assets are included. But properly owned life insurance proceeds are not included. The only time life insurance proceeds are included if you, the policy is on me and I don't have any beneficiaries listed in that policy. So it goes back to my estate then at that point, and that's included in my gross estate calculation. But most time you have a, a beneficiary listed on your insurance policies and it gets taken out of your estate if it's, if it's set up properly. Your estate can also have allowable deductions to lower your gross estate value. And so funeral expenses, any last medical expenses related to death, any administrative or legal fees that you take out, any debts that had to be paid off from the estate, any claims paid that people file for bills for the state, generally any amounts to a qualifying charity. We talked about this too. So those are allowed deductions. So at your death, you could say, I wanted to give so much to the church, so, so my high school, so much to my college, whatever you say in there, they'll lower the size of your, your, your taxable estate. Any amount to your spouse, again, is also not included. So there's some benefits to I love you, Will. It's it's a deduction if it all goes to the spouse. But that I love you was going to cause base some problems for her down the road. So, um, sales. While well, alive, you can do that. And sometimes you the younger generation wants to get a foothold or grub steak, I always say, in the farm. So you can make that sale while you're alive. The heirs get no set the basis. They get your basis, whatever it is. Transfers with a, with a sale. Uh, don't. I'm sorry. You get. You don't get a stepped up basis. The heirs get the price they paid for it, and um, you have to pay income tax on the difference between your basis and what you sell it to your heirs to. It's it's ordinary income or capital gains, depending on what your cost basis and purchase price was. We talked about a recapture tax and those kind of things. Ordinary depreciation recapture and those kind of things would come into play there. 
gifts. While you're alive, you can you can gift up to that twelve point nine two million and have no consequences federally. Minnesota has no gift taxes, so you can do that as long as you're under the twelve point nine two million. The basis you have with that gift goes with the gift. So there's no tax for estate taxes or gift taxes while it's due because you're unless you go over the twelve point nine two million. And if you do go over it, if I give the gift, I get to pay a tax on it as well. And inheritance after we pass. And we own those assets in our death, and we have control of them. So we had a revocable trust. We get a stepped up basis on whatever we control when we die. Um, possible exclusions are high right now, too. So that's, that's a really good thing to do. But again, we have to think about how we're going to pay for that nursing home expenses along the way. Be a cons good consumer of legal and financial advice. So again, we've talked about this workshop throughout. There are a lot of professionals out there to help you accomplish these processes along the way. We just try to highlight tools and give you some education so you, when you go see your professionals, you have an idea what you want to accomplish as you're going forward. So hopefully um, you'll have a better idea when you go see these professionals what you want to see done. Um, careful tax planning, both for income tax and for estate taxes is, is very useful to do at this time. You can avoid making some mistakes, or mistakes when you do this transfer process using that skill tax professional to help you along the way. And then hopefully avoid some errors. Um, again, legal services, we use a lot of things out there you can do online, but there's a lot of good people out there to help you do it legally in Minnesota and do the right tools for the right, um, what you want to accomplish with your goals, okay? We also have Suzanne uh, is online with us too. She's our, our third part of our teacher of this session. So she's Hopefully going to teach some next session on and on your handout it says October 28th. It's actually going to be October 25th. They're all on the on a Wednesday. And so there's her contact information or email uh, address. Our website is listed here as well. So if you go to that Z link, it'll take you right into our farm transition information online. So it's a good place to go to find more information. We have a whole bunch of fact sheets about uh, estate planning and farm transfer. There are two different things that you want to think about. And they're very informational. Again, we try not to give any legal advice, financial or tax advice. We are not professionals. We want you to go see your professionals with these ideas we share with you today and put the tools in action and get your goals accomplished. We want you to do something. That's the bottom line. We want you to do something because it's hard to do something about this fun subject sometimes. It's hard to get it. It's your foot forward. It's just that first step. It's hard to do. You just got to make that action take place. Um, the next session is on wills and trusts and title ownership. How's that mean to you? So again, we'll talk about how you have it titled. Is going to have more control over your assets than actually your wills or your trust because that title ownership is going to be the first thing you look at. Talk about that, and we have the that's the 25th of October, and then November 8th is we go over everything, put it all together. So again, the materials as Nathan put up there right away, we're at this Z link. Um, it also was attached to, with the. Uh, invitation to come today to the workshop or the, on there and also YouTube listed here if you want to watch this recorded session over in the future or share it with somebody else you can go to that YouTube link and find it there um we got a question up here on top Dave I noticed that we do have a couple people who have their hand raised would yeah, you be ahead. okay if I unmute them okay I'm sure. gonna unmute Betty, we're, first. we're ready for questions, I think. I think that's my last slide, I'm pretty sure. Awesome. Okay, I'm going to unmute Betty. Betty, if you had, had intended to ask a question, you can speak now. 